this was early days, you know, two early two thousands. And I saw, uh, a website and I was, and it was like motion graphics. Right. And I was blown away. I was like, I need to learn this. So I just hopped on, um, premiere and I even did animation in premiere and early after effects. Right. And I just taught myself how to animate. And then, so that I think I was doing the same thing in Flash at the same yes, time. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I did Flash. I did, I did early animation in Flash too, which was absolutely like self hate. You know, it's the worst. It was so bad. It's a dark, <laughs> dark period in it my was career. Like, yeah, it was very, very dark times. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host. Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Executive Creative Director of Attack Plan, Jose Gomez. Throughout his career, Jose has regularly shifted between live action, animation, and graphic design, cross-pollinating between the mediums to inform his design aesthetic with outside influences. While it may be common practice in the design space to stick to one lane and perfect a given discipline, Jose has found most growth as an artist by switching it up. He's worked with some impressive clients such as Gatorade, HBO, Mountain Dew, which I drank way too much of as a young guy, Ford, Adidas, Slack, Mercedes, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and at and I'm not sure if you guys have heard of being these clients, but these are kind of a big deal. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Jose Gomez. Okay, kids, all the way from Dallas, Texas, I'm chatting with Jose Gomez. Jose, welcome to Obsessed Show. Nice to meet you. Hey, good to Thanks meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the audience doesn't have to know how much time it took for us to get this actually set up, but <laughs> yes. it's so good to finally get the microphones and the cameras, yeah. which is maybe a good segue for me to say <laughs> lots of people are listening to this show. We need more people to turn and tune into the YouTube version as well. So if you'd like to see what this conversation looked like, you can head over to youtube.com slash Josh Miles to find that episode as well. But uh, let's jump in here. It is... Sure. It is September, 2020. Mm-hmm. Man, this year just just won't quit. Um, oh man, tell me about it. <laughs> how are things in Dallas? Like, how are you doing? How are you? How are you managing? Well, you know, pretty good actually. I mean, um, I'm okay with staying indoors, so I have my whole setup here at home, and uh, we've been really good at the office to. Uh, I mean, we were already working remotely on different things and we had that all set up, you know, with using Terra Dici and different methods like that. Uh, and we have been doing video meetings for a while. So it kind of was, you know, it was pretty smooth transition into the uh, kind of quarantine life. But, um, you know, I moved here two years ago and, and uh, you know, I don't think I could be living anywhere and get used to a pandemic. Right. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's such a shock, but, um, you know, we're doing the best we can and, um, you know, navigating kind of how you deal with clients and, you know, how, how that all kind of unfolds, but, you know, for, from, for the most part, it's, um, been pretty, pretty painless. You know, I think with tech, modern technology, it, it kind of just works out, you know, so you guys, according to the website, have offices in Hollywood and Dallas. Um, were you very remote to begin with or were you guys all going well, into offices prior to that? Yeah. So, no, we have, you know, we have about 200 people in Dallas and about 300 people in Montreal and another, you know, L.A. is more of the kind of like relationship and, and because we do a lot of um, entertainment work. So there's like 20 something people there. Mm-hmm. Um but the idea of remote working had been very much part of our company culture, right? Because there's so many people on the movie side that are working in Montreal that need to kind of work with Dallas and work with LA and and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, attack plan essentially is, um, the commercial division of real effects and real effects is like the entertainment and movie making side. So that's why we have so many employees because we're making like, really big animated movies. Like, uh, we just finished Scooby-Doo and, um, we're, you know, doing another one right now. Oh, nice. That's awesome. <clears throat> Called rumble. 
<clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> What's Rumble about? <clears throat> so Rumble is um I don't have COVID, I promise. Um, <clears throat> Rumble Rumble is a, a movie that's coming out and it's about um the long end of it is it's a it's a it's an animated movie about monsters wrestling and um and the relationship they have with their trainers that are human. Um so yeah, it's a it's gonna be a really cool movie when it comes out. Well, I'm really curious to dig into like the live action meets animation meets design of your background, mm -hmm. um, which may be a good place to start with is <clears throat> telling us your origin story. You know, which one of these things kind of sparked all of this and how right. did you get started? Right. So I have a I have a very kind of I think for our industry probably a pretty I don't know, I wouldn't say it's extremely unique because there's a lot of people that have kind of been born out of skateboard industry. Um, so when I was really young, um, around 15, 16, I started a little skateboard company. Um, and I'd always been drawing, sculpting, painting, um, you know, just doing a bunch of different art. And uh, when I started my skateboard company, I moved to California in like 94. Um, and then kind of one thing led to another and I sold that company to a company called K2. They make skis and, and snowboards and stuff. Yeah, definitely. I know K2. Yep. And, um, with their backing, we started, uh, a skateboard, another a skateboard company, but this time making apparel and footwear. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and back then before there was, you know, you, before there was a YouTube and before there was like online media, like you would have to, to promote your brand, right. You'd have to make these films or videos, they would call them back in, back oh, in yeah. those times. And, um, so that's how I kind of got into animation and live actions because through filming skateboarding and then bringing that stuff back, editing it, and then being like, what can I do that's unique and try to switch this up a little bit. And um, I saw, you know, this was early days, you know, two, early 2000s. And I saw uh, a website and I was, and it was like motion graphics, right? And I was blown away. I was like, I need to learn this. So I just hopped on um, Premiere and I even did animation in Premiere and early After Effects, right? And I just taught myself how to animate. And then, so that- I think I was doing the same thing in Flash at the same yes, time. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I did Flash. I did, I did early animation in Flash too, which was absolutely like self-hate. You know, it's the worst. It was so bad. It's a dark, <laughs> dark period in it my was career. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was very, very dark times. Um, it was tragic to say the least, animating in, in Flash. Um, but yeah, I learned uh, After Effects and then through that, it kind of snowballed into, okay, you know, our, the company that I sold to K2 and then eventually became this footwear brand, it had ballooned into like this huge company. And um, I kind of felt like, you know, it was, it, I think we were in hundreds of millions of dollars of, of revenue and whatever. And I wasn't... I don't think I was feeling as rewarded, you know, I was just kind of like had this creative angst to do something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. So I left at the height of that company, which I always said like, Oh, I, I want to leave on a high, you know, and I had set everything up and whatever. So I started my own uh, production company doing animation and live action called Shiloh. And um, you know, two years ago we, kind of joined forces with real effects to basically create attack plan. Right. And, um, that, that's, was the, this, that's the evolution that kind of came to that. Right. So like from early 2000 up to like 2017, you know, I was doing my own studio and then I joined forces with uh, real effects to head up there, you know, start attack plan and build that brand. And, um, yeah, it's been great, but, uh, you know, along the way, I kind of, you know, everything was self-taught and I learned so much and uh, been fortunate enough to, you know, direct things, you know, live action for, 
you know, directed Walking Dead promos and I mean, in Smart Car, Mercedes and, you know, all the, all the brands that you talk about, AT&T and mm-hmm. the Cavs. And so I, I've been fortunate enough to like take that creativity and kind of channel it into uh, commercial filmmaking. And, and I think that's what excites me, right? Is like going from, you know, designing skateboards, doing skateboard videos, snowboarding, designing shoes, industrial products to then like taking that creativity and then channeling it into animation and channeling it into live action and then combine, you know, combining them. And I think the intersection of those things are like what excites me the most, you know? Was it the design of the product, like the, your line that kind of birthed the interest in the media piece or did the media no. piece start first? And then by the way, like, let's try the skateboard brand. Well, no, it was, it was like, you know, we had, we had built the skateboard brand and back then what, what, in, what sparked the interest in mo- animation and motion was when I was doing the skateboard films you know, mm-hmm. we, we did a, a video called one step beyond and it was like, you know, it's like an hour long movie and it had all the team riders in there, you know, all the different skateboarders like yeah. Tony Hawk and Bam Margera and, you know, all those guys back the you know, w- that rode for me, um, and our company and, you know, and through that, right. Like when we released that video, then I start getting calls from MTV, like, Hey, can you do this show open for us? We love what you did with this oh, video cool. and whatever. So mm-hmm. early on, I did a lot of work for MTV and VH1 and then kind of graduated out of that into, you know, doing bigger budget, uh, commercials. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so what, what's a typical day look like for you at this point? I mean, you are self-described like so many different things that are on your plate, but like, yeah. you know, are you, are you in the, in the editing process? Are you out directing? Are you in meetings? Yeah, or- no, I mean, I think to the, I think mostly now it's, it's, um, I have basically a few functions, right. With the tag plan one, I kind of, you know, uh, along with, um, the managing director is Sky David Bates, good friend of mine. We um, created this brand, Attack Plan, right? So it's like really nurturing that brand as a, as a company and trying to build that. So the day to day process of trying to build up Attack Plan and and be strategic about how we move forward is one one part of my job. The other part is uh, definitely writing. I still do all my own pitches you know, directorial pitches and I'm out directing, uh, commercials, you know, the live action portion and then creative directing, um, the animation side as well. When the, when the jobs come back in. So most of the, most of my time, um, is creative directing and directing live action. I, I, I don't, I can animate still, but I don't actually am the one doing the animation now. Um, mm-hmm. just because I think also too, uh, there's people better at that than I am. Right. I'm, I, I think, um, my value lies in, in just kind of steering the ship and making sure the, the direction of the, of the work is in the right spot. Well, maybe to jump into a couple examples of what you guys do, we talked a little bit at the top of the show that you had a couple of projects, especially that were recent that you're proud of, uh, you know, one for, uh, for lays and one for slack. Can you maybe mm-hmm. kind of talk us through some of those projects and how you guys were involved? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess we'll start with Slack. Um, and both of them are, are really great and they have different levels of what, you know, at attack plan, I think our sweet spot is the intersection between live action, animation and design. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, Slack was a really great one because they really wanted a very practical approach. Right. But with a very kind of, um, art directed and almost, uh, animated feel to the live action. So, you know, we, I came up with this concept of, you know, they wanted to visualize the Slack rooms and whatnot. So I came up with this, this concept of seeing our main, uh, star, uh, you know, from subject to subject, she would transition from room to room. And we did that all practically. Right. So we built four huge colored rooms, that, uh, you know, she was attached to a dolly and the camera was on the dolly and we dollied 
left to right to, to slide. The, so it looked like the rooms were sliding in every time she changed the subject mm, matter. Cool. So the, you know, it was like a, you know, highly art directed, you know, you could probably watch the spot on our, on our website, but it's like a highly art directed room that signified these slack rooms. Right. So she um, and the camera move, but the rooms are not physically right. so, so trucking like the, back and forth. No. So, but it looks that way in camera, right? Because she's, she's essentially like, parented to the camera right and and the desk and where she's sitting and everything that she's touching is parented to the camera and they're both on uh, a huge set of dolly tracks right and then the camera and her move on the dolly track left to right and then essentially behind her you know is, is a huge set <laughs> so it's like a gigantic set that has four rooms back to back and the effect is that she just looks like a room is sliding behind her so uh, this is getting into a really geeky question, but mm -hmm. how did you determine or, um, you know, what was the desired effect that you, you could have filmed her on CG and then moved this, you know, produced room behind her? Like, yeah. what, tell me about like, why did we do it? Why? For, yeah, why take the time to build the room out? Yeah. Well, because there's a, there to me, especially um, there is a certain level of intangibility, I guess, if, if that's even a word, like, an intangible quality that you lose when you do that in CG. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, they wanted to have a very, um, I don't know if crafty is the right word, maybe it is, but a very practical feel. And I think if we had done that in CG, which we could have totally done in CG, it would have almost been too slick. Right. And, yeah. and, and you wanted to have a little bit of those, uh, kind of happy accidents to happen and the choreography with the actors in the background. And also too, you're, you're dealing with uh, live action actors in those rooms and the sense of parallax, you'd kind of, it would be, it would, you'd lose that if you filmed them on a flat plate. Right. So seeing their backs and then wrapping around to the front side of them, you know, while our main actress is in the foreground, you, you, it would be really hard to achieve that. So <clears throat> excuse me, making, uh, making that all practical is definitely the best way to go. Cool. That's all. I love the, just the, the added mm. detail, like, like, Oh, the, the prevailing wisdom might be, we just animate this thing but uh -huh. to, to think about like how we're going to physically make this work <laughs> within your giant dolly and all that. Um, I have to imagine within the COVID environment that clients are asking you for different things than maybe they were before all of this. Yeah. What kind of trends are you seeing or what kinds of um, themes or requests are, are becoming more common these days? Uh, animation. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of animation. Um, <clears throat> you know, when COVID first started and I think the pandemic first started, the, the, the big prevailing thing was this kind of panic at first, you know, we were sending out cause you know, in our industry, you send out reels, you know, and we were sending out <clears throat> so many new reels that first few months because people were agencies were trying to uh, save their projects. You know, how can they save their projects using, stock footage or taking the mm -hmm. footage that they already had and animating over it or, or reconcepting it. So it's animated. The prevailing thing now is, and, and you're starting to see some of it come back, right? Like shooting, you know, going back on set and being socially distant and shooting, um, you know, outside and, and, and production starting to ramp back up, but it's been very kind of touch and go, up until I think, you know, maybe a month ago, it's starting, people are starting to dip their feet back into doing live action shoots. But outside of that, the request to do spots that are fully animated has definitely increased. Yeah. And this, this is going to, I guess, timestamp our episode a little bit more here, but I just saw a headline this morning that, um, that Robert Pattinson, who's the, you know, Batman in the new series, uh, just tested positive. Um, wow. So you know, that production slamming shut. And, you know, there's all these questions around like making sure he has it and all this, but yeah, you know, I'm just wondering um, how much we'll see like things easing and then slamming shut and then easing again. Um, oh, for sure. Because everybody, 
I think most people, they assume that if you stay socially distant, that you won't get COVID, but there hasn't really been a large scale kind of application of that theory, right? Because, I mean, now you're starting to see schools go back in, but it's probably going to take another two weeks, a month to decipher whether or not those experiments of, of coming back together again are actually working. Mm -hmm. Um, because like that movie, you know, they probably were on set following all the rules and he probably got it from someone on set, you know, and who knows? So it's definitely going to be, you know, we were talking about this in our office. It's, it's, when we go back into our office, right, we're not going to all go back at, go in at the same time. And I think the, the, uh, some, some people think, oh, one day it'll just be like back to normal. No, I don't think, like we're thinking it's going to be more of a trickle, you know, back to normal. A couple people here, half, you know, quarter staff, but it's not going to just be this big, you know, everybody back in the office type thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see how, how COVID plays out and, and hopefully, you know, it doesn't affect our industry any more than it already has um, because it has. And uh, I think anyone who says that it doesn't is crazy because it's definitely halted many productions, you know, many live action productions and uh, campaigns in general, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of agencies are, are being very cautious right now. What do you think will be kind of the, the short term impact in the next 12 to 24 months? Are there, things that you're seeing brands doing differently or, you know, the productions that you're working on? um, Or is it, is it really more of just the distance set and the distance teams? Um, I mean, it's really hard to say. Uh, I think the next 12 to 24 months is probably going to be slightly down in production and probably more geared towards remote production, right? So animation, um, you know, if it's live action, a lot of it will probably be outdoor um, and concepting, you know, like concepting with COVID in mind. Does that make sense? Like Mm -hmm. trying to come up with ideas that uh, don't put people at risk while still getting that message across, I think could be a big thing, but it's really hard. I mean, I've been doing this a really long time. And the thing that I haven't gotten any better at is telling the future (laughs) or reading (laughs) minds. So, so every time I'm like, Oh yeah, this is going to happen you know, something else happened. So, um, yeah, but the one thing I know for sure, it's, it's not going to just instantly overnight go back to, you know, what it was, uh, before it'll, it'll trickle back into that. I think for sure. You know, I had an interview right before this where I was chatting with a friend of mine who's been on the show a few times and, and he's in a new role, having gone from more of a freelance designer to being a, collegiate design professor or or lecturer, I guess is the formal title. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about challenges that graduating seniors and juniors are looking at now. So um, we didn't talk about this before, but if you were going to give advice to these students who are kind of winding down their college experience, you know, what's going to help them stand out to a company uh, operating in today's environment and what are things that maybe they might think of differently than they would have a few years back? Wow. That's a really good question. Um, because it involves like essentially the root of your question is what, how can they change their approach to, you know, best take advantage of the times, I guess. Yeah. What do they optimize today so that when they're on the job market in May or, you know, a year and a half from now that they're ready? Well, I think, you know, more than anything is, is, uh, being able to (laughs) communicate, somehow communicate that you're just as capable remotely and being independent 
rather than having to be in a, an environment where you need a lot of direction, because I think that could be, to me, <clears throat> I like, especially in general, I like to hire people that are smarter than me and more capable than me. Right. So if there is a way for that young, uh, you know, just out of college person to demonstrate that they're uh, totally capable on their own to make great work and to do it remotely. I think, you know, that, that is a, a big plus. A lot of um, the people that we pick are is usually based on obviously their work, but what they did on the project is another big thing because sometimes people put, projects on their website where they're a big, you know, there's a big team behind it. And let's say all they did was, you know, a roto or something or whatever, but it's, it's really beneficial when, when designers or animators will list what they did on the project and be very specific about their um, capability and task related to that project. So I think if you, I think for new people coming out of college, it's like, how can you how can you show that you're fiercely independent and you don't need a lot of hand holding at times like this right because you need to be able to be self sufficient and be able to take a a, a kernel of direction and then uh flesh it out you know from from a remote location so i mean i think i think you know um Showing that wherewithal, I think, is a good, is a really attractive thing, and at least for me, when I'm I'm looking at people, because when I when I look at someone, uh, you know, you can immediately immediately tell whether or not they're capable um, of doing those things on their own. So, so maybe a companion question to this: um, when you're hiring young <clears throat> talent, are you looking for more generalist Swiss Army knife types, or are you looking for specialists? Personally, I like generalists because I like people that 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 are Swiss Army knife, not because of any not because that's the way I am, but because I feel that th they are good at problem solving. You know, like when you're stuck in a lane and, and don't get me wrong, specialists are great too. We have, we have a lot of specialists in our office, but I really like people that um, I'm more attracted to people that can design, draw, paint, animate, you know, like a real uh, artistic background, you know, and they have that eye um, because, you know, you might have some people that are really good at say lighting or you know, modeling, but they necessarily can't draw or they can't paint or whatever. And not everyone can, but to me, I think when you can, like, if, if let's say you're, um, a modeler, right. A 3d modeler or you're a lighter, but you're not conveying the fact that you can actually sketch or draw or paint and you, and you're not showing that work. You probably should. Right. Because I think that's such an added plus when I, when I come across someone, cause there's a couple guys in our office and girls that are incredible artists, but also the best, you know, surfacers or lighters or mo modelers that, that work in our office, but they also can draw storyboards, you know, or they can, they can do character development. Um, so I think, I think showing that artistry is, is really nice. How about when you were coming up in the biz or maybe even currently, do you, do you have design heroes that you looked up to or, you know, oh, yeah. directors or <laughs> animation houses or. Yeah. 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 Um, well, David Carson is like hmm. huge, huge for me. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, I even like interviewed at Ray gun magazine and. Oh, very cool. Uh, and uh, I mean, I was just all about that back then and I still love David Carson. Um, so he's like a, a hero to me. Um, he was on well, season one of the show. We'll have to link to that in oh, today's really? show notes. So, and I'll, I'll send you a link so you can check yeah. it out. And he's awesome too. I, I commented on something like on his, uh, you know, on Facebook or I can't remember. I just said, great. And he, he emailed me back and was just the nicest guy. Oh yeah. But, totally. um, very accessible. Know. Oh yeah. He's, he's 
legend. Um, so him, and then on the, on the directing live action directing side, I'd say Bruno Avilon. Um, he's a French director and he does a lot of, um, um, kind of fashion work, but it's in, and you know, he does stuff for like Cartier and L'Oreal and that kind of stuff, but his, his photography style and the way he directs live action is, is very visual and poetic and almost distorted in a weird way. Um, so he's, he's huge influence on me, um, from a live action directing side. And I don't, although I don't get to some of the things I've directed like walking dead or I did a spot for GE, uh, definitely had a big, he had a big influence and I could use some of the techniques that he uses. Um, but you know, most of the stuff that I direct, uh, you know, it's hard to kind of be really moody, you know, when the product is, you know, happy, like a pep, <laughs> like Pepsi or something, you know, right. it's easier to do that with like walking dead. Right. You know, and, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, but yeah, uh, I think him and then gosh, who else? Uh, I've ha- I have so many, but, um, I think probably those, those two people, um, really really stand out immediately to me those those two bruno and uh david carson yeah good stuff um what would you count as one of your proudest professional moments Hmm. that's hard to say um i think probably probably doing um I had a really good time uh, directing the walking dead. That was cool because I had full access to everything. And, and it, and it was the idea <clears throat> was, um, you know, my idea and it was, uh, how do you say untouched, you know, <laughs> like they, they just, ran with it and let me yeah. do what I needed to do. And it came out great. I was really proud of it. I think that project's, you know, a really proud moment for me. I think another one that I really enjoy is uh, the campaign that I did for uh, smart car um, for Mercedes. Mm, yeah. And uh, you know, it was like, I went to Buenos Aires for, I don't know, a few weeks and shot down there for like 10 days. And uh you know, the campaign, it, it, it involves animation and live action. And just is that it's so well written, you know, um, it was written, um, by this guy, Tom, uh, Hollander. He, he works at, he, at the time he worked at BBDO Berlin and now he's a, he's a, has his own agency. I don't even know. I forget, I forget the name, but the most clever writing, you know, and it was such a, such a great, uh, great creative to work on. And then I think winning the Emmy and for Showtime, that was that, you know, that was really cool too. And I think, you know, and then, you know, recently I think directing the, the Lay's campaign for Pepsi was really cool. Um, and just kind of another, another opportunity to do things where they didn't really, they had such a great concept and it wasn't altered, you know, it was like so pure. So some really good times over the years. So we, uh, you've rattled off a bunch of, uh, you know, a list clients and you guys have done some amazing work. So no surprise that you're attracting those kind of clients, uh, early on. Do you feel like there were, you know, especially ways that you use to bring in the right clients or to kind of attract them or to gauge whether this great brand was actually going to be good to work with? Well, I think we were lucky back then, like early two thousands, because there wasn't really the, we were doing things that were, hadn't been necessarily done before in commercial filmmaking, right? Because up till then motion graphics animation wasn't really a thing in the traditional sense it is now, right? It, there was animation and motion graphics, but it wasn't really, um, excuse me, fleshed out like it is now. Um, and now there's way more competition. There's so many amazing studios, right? That do amazing work. But when, when 
we, you know, when we started in the early 2000s, uh, motion graphics was like a new term, you know, and it was like really, there was probably a handful of competitors, you know, like I, uh, you know, Chris Doe's company, Blind, um, Stardust, Brand New School, PSYOP, and Superfad, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was like, now you'd be hard pressed to like, you know, say what the group is that's at the forefront of, of motion graphics and animation. Cause there's just so many studios doing incredible work, you know, from guys even in like Germany and, and, you know, faraway countries that you didn't think they would have a, a really strong uh, studio component, but oh my gosh, I, there's hundreds of, of great studios now. So the competition's grown immensely. And I think that makes it harder uh, to get those bigger clients, right? But back then it was a little bit easier because they would, they wanted, you know, everybody wants what's new and exciting and whatever. And, and I think back then some of those brands saw what we did with MTV and they were like, we love what you guys did with the uh, Bam Margera show open. And we want to do this like, you know, Scion commercial with some kind of elements of that. Right. You know, we did it. And actually we did, uh, I worked on a campaign with, uh, uh, actually with blind, uh, doing Shiloh did one spot blind did another one. I think Stardust did the other one and we did it for Scion. And it oh, was cool. like Scion used to be this like brand, the car brand that you might've heard of, but they, they, I don't think, they just kind of wrapped up into Toyota now, but um, that was one of those things where they saw some work that we did, you know, for one of the shows that we were working on, they were like, Hey, we want you to animate for this. So definitely, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of ebbs and flows, but back then it was just a little bit easier to, uh, to get noticed. So at, at this point, you've got a great portfolio to, to stand on. Um, you know, when, when a client is looking at you and another equally strong competitor, like mm -hmm. how do you guys differentiate yourself? So what do you think are kind of the, the main things that stand out that help someone choose you? Well, I, I mean, to me, I'm a big believer in um, concept and story, right? And concept being probably equally or even more important than anything else, because I always tell everyone that it works in our office. I'm like, just because we make it look amazing. Right. And we do a plus work and visually it, it's all, you know, stunning and buttoned up and whatever else that's not enough. Right. Like everybody, there's a lot of studios and I bet you if, if usually if we're getting bid on a project, we're bidding against other people or other companies that are equally or more even uh, historically capable than even, you know, have a longer track record than even we do. Um, but if at the end of the day you have a concept or you plus their concept to where you're bringing value to that concept and you, and you're actually fleshing it out more and you're smarter and more clever about it, then that, that, that compels them to award you the job. Right. Because I think, and even when I'm pitching jobs, I'm like, I know the mill can make this look amazing. I know, you know, PSYOP can make this look amazing. And I know this, you know, or, or any of the other uh, big studios that we pitch against, they, we can all make it look incredible. Right. It's just, that's the given it's trying to come up with the angle and the hook and the kind of value add to their concept that, that compels people to, to go with you. Right. Because um, if you can demonstrate that, then that's something that your other competitors can't take away from you. Well, conversely, are there, uh, perhaps red flags, things that you look out for when a client wants you to pitch them or they mm. come to you with a concept and you're like, okay, this, this isn't mm -hmm. a fit for us because of these red flags or these things that you identify. What are some of those that you guys look out for? Um, 
Well, one red flag for me personally is when they won't reveal to you what the budget is. You know, we can't reveal the budget just yet, but it's really cool creative. I understand that, but you almost need the budget to understand what the parameters are because, yeah. you know, without, without that knowledge, um, it's a red flag, right? Yeah. Um, How to scope and scale that concept. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that you need to assess whether or not that you pitching that job is worth the risk, you know, because a lot of times too, this notion of, you know, it, it, whether we like it or not, the prevailing uh, method is you, the, people don't get paid. Companies don't get paid for pitching. You pitch to win the job, then you get paid and blah, blah, blah. That in and of itself is a, is a little bit of an issue because you need to assess what you're getting into. Um, and without a budget, you, you can't really you can't really decide whether or not it's worth the risk to, to spend the time and the money to do a fleshed out pitch. Right. Another thing I think, uh, that's a red flag is, uh, I, I call it a pitch for a pitch. So it's like the client doesn't really have the end. You know, we're at the bottom of the food chain. If you think about it, right. Is you have uh, a client, you have the agency and then you have production. And when the agency doesn't actually have the client awarded, you're just basically pitching, you know, pitching for pitching, right? You're, you're trying yeah. to help the agency win the work. And that to me is always a little bit of a red flag. So when you get paid to do that, um, it, it, it works out. But when you, you know, when an agency wants you to do it for free to help them. And then if you, if you help them win the work, they're going to give you the production on it. That is a little bit of a red flag for me because it's like, it's so speculative that uh, I, I'm always like, Oh, like this is a pitch for a pitch. This isn't real. You know, I'm more like, yeah. I'm more like, I like when things are buttoned up and, and usually you know, I don't think, um, I mean, I, I would say agencies come to production companies for a specific task or style, right. Or the, like something that kind of it's in your wheelhouse. Um, but usually the best practices I see from agencies is like, they'll send you the creative, you sign the NDA, you do whatever you need to do. It's like, here's the, here's the creative, here's the budget here's how long you guys have to pitch do a creative call to kick off, do the pitch, present the pitch. And then you get word whether or not you've been awarded the job or it's gone to some other studio. That, mm -hmm. that to me is just the most basic fundamental, simple way of going about it. Right. It's like creative budget, go pitch. And you're like, all right, this job is 350,000. They want to do, you know, X number of days of shooting. They want to do this much in post. Oh, we can't do four days of shooting. We can only do two days. So we're going to propose two here and one here. And then we're going to, you know, and it's all very buttoned up and standard. Um, and, and that to me is the, is when I'm like, all right, this is a real job. And then it makes you feel good too. When they, when they come to you and they're referencing your own work, right. They're saying, Oh, we like what you did on this you know, this project you did for Dubai and we're using that as reference for our creative. We want you to pitch on that. And then that kind of gives you a little bit more of a oomph to be like, oh, okay, they, they're, they're liking us already. They're using our work as reference. So let's double down and make the, this presentation as best we can. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's speculative, like when agencies are like, oh, you know, we want you to pitch this work and you know, you ask, well, what's the budget? Oh, well, we haven't, we don't actually have the work yet. We want you to pitch it so that we can then win it. And if we win it, we can, you know, we'll, we'll do a job, but you know, what is that job or what is that thing? That to me is like, ugh, you know? Yeah. Is, is there anything that you're um, seeing in, in terms of trends currently <laughs> that, 
kind of drive you crazy. Like, and I know all of us with design aesthetic, like we have our own preferences, but is there anything that you're seeing more and more of that? You're just like, man, we got to make that stop. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it might not be the popular opinion, but <clears throat> it's the current, I think the current, I mean, even though I love the style, it's just been beaten down so much as the really flat, 2d kind of bulbous humanoid uh yeah you know what i'm talking about <clears throat> like where you know it's you see it a lot like on facebook like facebook ad campaigns or or uh, dropbox campaigns and it's just like flat 2d bulbous humanoid creatures you know doing their thing and it's basically everywhere right now and it, it it's not that i don't like it it's just that uh you know, there's, it's just, it's just everywhere. There's yeah, just it's no, it's hard to no, stand out when everybody looks the, the same. same. Yeah. Everyone looks the same. It's, it's very, uh, very sameness, right? Like, and, um, yeah, that, that to me is like, okay, I get it. I've seen it a kajillion times. Like what, what else can we do that, uh, you know, doesn't make every technology company out there or every startup look like they came from the same artist, you know? <laughs> right. Um, maybe just all the same VC. Yes. Uh, are there um, dream projects that you have, things you haven't gotten into yet, or maybe clients or film yes. franchises? Yes. Um, and so like, just like three weeks ago, um, I got a call from Apple to do the new campaign for, uh, one of their new products. Um, I, I won't mention the product, but because they're very secretive, but so, um, yeah, I had a meeting with Apple, you know, the creatives at Apple and it was fantastic. And, and like, that was one client that I haven't done work for yet in a direct sense. And over the years, I've had many interviews with Apple on different projects, but it never, you know, panned out. And this one, the project went away because they changed direction, but they were really excited, you know, and everybody was kumbaya. And that was one that I was like, dang it. You know, because I, re I think that to me, uh, I've pretty much done you know, I've done Samsung, I've done, I've done all the big brands, but I think Apple, just because they, they, they have really great creative and the creative specifically that they were coming to me for was very geared towards my uh, way of thinking, you know, and my kind of triangulation of forms like uh, live action and animation combined. Mm -hmm. And that was the concept. So um, to see that one kind of fizzle away, it was a disappointment, but, you know, I'm sure there'll be more, and hopefully next time it, it pops off. Nice. Um, maybe along those lines, um, and th this doesn't necessarily have to be anything work related. So it could be something at home or whatever, but, mm -hmm. um, I find that our design tribes <laughs> were pretty obsessive. What do you, what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? In the sense of design? Yeah, it could be anything. Like, what's the thing that when I... Oh, um, gosh, that's, that's such a hard question. I think, you know, like, this is totally outside of... Well, I'm trying to think, like, what, what, what I'm completely obsessed with right now. Um, I've been... This is something so as you know, outside of normal design or whatever, but yeah, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been fiddling with industrial design in this program called fusion 360 mm -hmm. and it's uh, made by Autodesk. And, um, I, like I just, because, you know, during COVID I, I, I wanted to, cause I have a 3d printer and like, I, you know, I'm like, um, I I'm sitting in my, my, I'm in a racing, you know, so I have this big like simulation, uh, racing simulator. I'm sitting in it right now because I just had the camera here. And, um, so I have a 3d printer and I needed to print little parts, you know, for, um, so like, 
here's a st- the steering wheel I made, right? So I had, oh, a, nice. I had a, so I printed the handles or whatever, but I had to like figure out the engineering behind it or whatever. So I I I picked up and like I made these shifters, but I I picked up um this app called Fusion 360 and I started to learn industrial design in three because I, I mean and modeling all the stuff. But that app is so much more geared towards industrial design and CNC, you know, like fabrication and 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 mm-hmm. and that kind of workflow that it was such a shock to me because I've been used to the kind of Maya workflow, the animated workflow, and to see things set up in a way where it was all very um you know, the different environments that you work in, like the material environment or the construction environment. Um, that to me was, um, and I'm looking at it right now, but that, that to me was really exciting to learn something new. And it like, my mind was melting, you know, like I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, Oh my God, you can do this. You know? And I'd, I, I like tinker and make these things and print them in 3d. And I'd be like, I just made something out of nothing, you know? And <laughs> I, I, I think that was like, that's that kind of creativity sparks, sparks my um, imagination so much is when I, you know, like Maya or After Effects or mm-hmm. those programs I, I know well and, you know, you, you can do things. And I think early on, you know, they, they blew my mind. Now I'm more like, oh, I know how to do that. Like you want this technique, you go here and you pre-comp it and you do this and blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, you can get it done. But when you get into a new program and you're like, every day you have your head explode because you're like, I, I just did that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe you can do this. Oh my God. Like this app does this. And that's the way I felt when I first started with after effects or with, uh, you know, even illustrator, like when it first came out. Um, so to get that feeling again, to get into a program where I have no knowledge of industrial design on, on a three dimensional scale, like I had zero and to just like, since COVID just sit here at home and like learn this from nothing. Um, that was something that just like, I was like, wow, this is another way of, of, of doing something creative, but at the same time, just you know, melting your mind with all this like learning that you're doing. Um, yeah, I think, that's awesome. And that, that to me is the most exciting thing when I'm learning so much that my mind is melting. I'm like, I, I, I get, I get a, like a high, you know, <laughs> I just recently got into like recently in the last two years, got into some video editing and, uh, you know, learning Premiere Pro. And every time I learn a little trick, I'm like, Hey, did you guys see this? And they're oh, like, no. okay, thanks. Great. Yeah, exactly. They're like, <laughs> like, they're like what, you, what happened? Yeah, exactly. I know. And you're like, you tell like, you know, someone you're like, Oh my God, did you know you could do that? And they're like, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what that program is. No, for. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Well, Hey, before we let you go here, Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you have a favorite piece of advice that you received, or maybe a favorite piece of advice to pass along to members of your team. Um, well, it's a very old saying, uh, and it's been used a lot, but I think it applies so much to our industry and especially people trying to come into advertising or uh, video production or commercial production from school. And it's been the guiding principle, I think, in everything I do, because I just like when I pitch every day, it, I, I feel it, I live it, but it's the concept of um, to achieve the success that you want, right? Or to break into something, you have to be able to go from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. Mm. So to me, that applies on almost everything I do because, you know, even say when we're pitching on, on work, we might lose four pitches in a row, right? Or five pitches in a row. And to maintain that level of enthusiasm to do your best job, and to go again and again and again and again until you do win, those are the things that I think separates um, the the breakthrough to success. You know, because if you give up, then it's and if you don't have that tenacity, uh, you're just not going to break through that invisible barrier. You know. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Yeah. Jose. Um, 
tell our listeners where they can connect with you after the show here, find you on the interwebs and, uh, and find more attack plan. Yeah. Um, so attack plan is, uh, www because that stands for World Wide web. <laughs> <laughs> and the web address is atkpln.com. And you can, you can, uh, probably reach me there. Um, or, uh, yeah, I think I think my Twitter handle is Jose Six uh, O M E Z uh, tweets, I think, or something. I can't remember, but you you could find me through the website. We'll put that uh, in the show notes. <laughs> yes, yeah, something well. like that. Something like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll email you that info. Excellent. Well, right. it was great uh, getting to know you today. And Likewise. Uh, yeah. Thanks for being on the show and thanks yeah. for being obsessed with design. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, kids, that's episode number 152 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.